MogCast, a fortnightly conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg about the topics of the day. Welcome to another edition of the MogCast. This is Paul Goodman, editor of Conservative Home, in conversation with a recently returned from the cricket, Jacob Rees-Mogg. So, how did you enjoy the World Cup it final? Was- extremely exciting. I, I went with my eldest son and I'd said to him at the beginning of the year, he could come with me either to the final or to a day of the ashes. But of course, with the final, he didn't know which teams would be in it. And he tried to persuade me I should let him decide later on when we knew the teams. And I said, no, 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 you've got to make the choice. Anyway, he chose the final and could he have chosen a better day to go. I mean, it was it was so exciting that at the end, both my eyebrows raised in unison, which I think is a considerable degree of excitement on my part. I see you tweeted, who needs Europe, or words to that effect. Yes, I did, um, which enormously upset the uh, snowflakes. Um, I do think the pro-Europeans are a very really humorless lot. This was not meant as my most profound political comment of the year. This, I'm just sticking to the subject for a moment. There's been a lot of commentary this morning about the diversity of the England team uh, and the monstrosity of your tweet, I should add. Um, But once people come to this country, they are as British as people who have been here for hundreds of generations. And that's one of the great things about our nation, that uh, if you are the holder of a British passport, you're as British as anybody. And I think that's something we should be proud about in our team. I I think the um, snowflakes have been very snowflakey about my tweet. Let's treat that as the final word on the cricket and um, move on to, uh, inevitably, the leadership um, election. What's your estimate of where we are on turnout? I think turnout is high. Um, I think your figure from last week of 70% is likely to be right. I asked my own association at a dinner on Friday evening how many of them had voted. I didn't ask them how they'd voted, but I asked how many had voted, and almost every hand went up. So I think actively engaged members have almost all sent their cards back. There will be a few less actively involved, and there'll be a few people like me who live in two places who have got more than one ballot paper who are only sending one ballot paper back. So when you take those things into consideration, I think you'll find that most people who are going to vote have voted by now. Question that follows, therefore, if that's right, is has Boris Johnson already won? Well, it's unwise to judge these things early, that you never know what may happen, um, that the polling for Boris is very good, the meetings I've been doing for Boris are very encouraging, but how many elections have we had where we knew the result and then the result is different when it comes in? If you look at the 2017 general election, many of us thought that Theresa May was heading to a huge majority, and that wasn't how it worked. It would be the most astonishing turn-up, first, for the Boris campaign on on the ground, which um, uh, says when it talks to journalists that Boris Johnson's doing pretty well, for our own survey, and of course for YouGov, who in a poll the Saturday before last put Boris Johnson on 74% of the vote. It looks very good for Boris, and it would be silly of me to say otherwise. I'm just adding that note of caution uh, that one shouldn't count chickens before they're hatched. Tell me about, um, let's have a discussion about an underreported aspect of the campaign, which is what you might call the ground war. I mean, our uh, listeners will have, uh, in many cases, followed the the air war, the Andrew Neil interviews last Friday, the um, uh, ITV debate earlier last week, but they won't necessarily um, be conversant with what's happening on the ground. So just give me a sense of what you've been doing in the last month for the Boris Johnson campaign on the ground and what it involves. Um, Well, I've been doing whatever I can to get out and about to speak to Conservative associations to put the argument for supporting Boris. I've been uh, as far north as uh, Aberdeen. I've been um, to the Cluid West. Um, I've been all over the country uh, addressing association events with um, between dozens and hundreds of members at each event. I think the best attended was in Windsor and Maidenhead where we had comfortably over a couple of hundred and um, some inevitably been smaller. And it's about getting out there, putting the case, making the points, 
and seeing what the support for Boris is, and I've, I found it's very encouraging. Let's take last week. Were you basically doing a campaign event literally every working day of the week? Oh, I was doing three or four, yes. Um, so I've done as many as I could fit in with the journey times that you need. And just to fill in the picture, um, th- this isn't a case unless anyone was under a misapprehension of simply Boris Johnson and Jacob Rees-Mogg touring the country. This is uh, a considerable body of pro-Boris Johnson MPs, isn't it? Oh, that's absolutely right. A lot of MPs have been out doing it. Um, So uh, Peter Bone and Tom Persglove have been organising their tour, which I coincided with at a few events last week. Priti Patel's been out, Ian Duncan Smith's been out. Bill Cash has been out, been very widespread campaigning for for Boris. Are MPs organising in different regions or is it all being organised by campaign organisers? A bit of both, that lots of MPs are organising things in their own area, but there is some central organisation. And then I was just going wherever I was told to go. So the Boris campaign said, go and I goeth, um, like the centurion's servant. Uh, And that worked very well. I'm just pursuing this out of interest because it's always interesting to try to get a sense of where Conservative members are. I mean, have you spent more time in the South than the North? Have you spent a lot of time in Scotland? What's your sense of where the membership is in terms of numbers? Um, Where have I been? I did two days in Scotland, up in Aberdeen and in Edinburgh and around Edinburgh. Uh, I've done a couple of trips to Yorkshire and also to Lancashire, I've done one trip to Lancashire. So I've done some parts of uh, the north of England, and um, then I've been in the home counties a bit as well, um, in Kent and in Essex and in Sussex. And so where are people? Well, you've got to understand this is partly self-selecting, that people who are going to come and hear me, knowing that I'm speaking for Boris, are more likely to be well disposed towards Boris to start with. But there are always a few who come up to me at the end and say, well, we were backing Jeremy Hunt, but now we've shifted. So you get some people who want to hear the argument, uh, but the feeling is extraordinarily positive for Boris. Um, And what's your sense of, you're the wrong person to ask in a sense, I know, but what the Jeremy Hunt campaign is doing on the ground? Well, I did a a hustings with James Cartledge uh, in Norwich, and James is working hard and going round and doing much what I was doing for for Boris. I don't know how much of that has been going on. Only one of the events I did was a hustings meeting rather than a rally for Boris. So I don't don't know how many of those have been going on. No sense of that. Um, Let's um, just for the benefit of the listeners try to think our way through what's going to happen next. Uh, And let's have this conversation on the presumption that Boris Johnson indeed wins. Um, We're not that far away from a declaration. I think it's on um, Tuesday week. Mm. Um, So the time is approaching. Just first of all, is there a possibility that he doesn't become prime minister at all because there's suddenly an ambush by 10 to 15 Conservative MPs who say... Uh, we're completely opposed to his stance on no deal. We're not going to support him. Theresa May, therefore, is unable to recommend to the Queen that he <clears throat> he kiss his hands. Uh, and we have a sudden, unexpected crisis, just as Parliament is due to break up for the summer. Well, what would be the effect of that? And what is the constitutional position? Um, if there were a number of Conservative MPs who said that, I think Theresa May would still have to indicate to the Queen that Boris Johnson was the person most likely to command a majority. It's hard to see who else would be more likely to command a majority. And it is the one piece of advice that the Sovereign is not obliged to follow. The outgoing Prime Minister's advice on a successor is not advice in the normal sense. That is to say, the monarch is at liberty not to accept it. Um, So we shouldn't be too head up with what Theresa May has to say. This problem actually falls on the Queen herself. I think you can only test the opinion of the House of Commons by a vote in the House of Commons. And I think, therefore, if this were to happen, the way to test it would have to be through a vote of confidence. 
with um, Boris Johnson having kissed hands or not? Well, it, this again is difficult constitutional territory because if you go back to the 19th century and how indeed the 18th century and how this used to be done, the Queen uh, would ask somebody to try to form a government and that person would become Prime Minister when that had been done successfully. However, the recent practice is that the office of Prime Minister should never be vacant, as with the office of monarch. And so I don't know whether we would look back to the historic precedents and say that actually what the Queen will do is say to Boris, will you try to form a government, or whether she will in fact have made him Prime Minister. And it is a very important difference. I think, by the way, this conversation is somewhat academic, since um, I think the balance of probability is that this dramatic declaration won't happen, and that Boris Johnson almost certainly will become Prime Minister. But it's just worth testing out all the possibilities, given the extraordinary events that have happened in the political world recently, after all. Yes, so one's got to be a bit careful. Um, you and I find discussing um, the uh, um, intricacies of the Constitution absolutely fascinating. And it is a slightly risky thing, because... In discussing the intricacies of the Constitution, there's been a lot of talk about prorogation. And I think that has set a hair running of the most ludicrous nature that a Prime Minister might suspend Parliament for months, which I think is absurd and politically would be enormously damaging. And so one always has to deal, and it's one of the virtues of our Constitution, with the Constitution within the confines of political reality. And having an uncodified Constitution gives us flexibility and means that there are things which could theoretically be done which never will be done. And therefore, the, these very interesting conversations mustn't set too many hairs running. Let's come back to prorogation since you've released that hair from a box. Um, you haven't set it running, but you've, you've um, pointed towards that particular hair. Let's leave it aside for a moment and just stick to the time so it's assume. Boris Johnson uh, becomes Prime Minister the week after next. Do you think the Labour Party will immediately seek a vote of confidence? I don't think they will. But I think if they did, it would be beneficial for Boris. Uh, I mean, I happen to think that an immediate vote of confidence would be won and would make it clear that Boris was Prime Minister without any question, both by appointment by the Crown and also by confidence of the House of Commons. Uh, and therefore, why won't Labour do it? Well, they don't want to help Boris. And does the Labour Party really want an election? Is it a vote they would like to win at the moment? If you look at Labour's poll rating, it's pretty dire. You've also presumably got to trade off um, Conservative MPs who might not support Boris Johnson in a vote of confidence. We'll come back to that in a moment. Not only with Labour MPs who are nervous of a general election, but we've now got all these independents floating around and there's no knowing what all of these people would do in a vote of confidence, is there? It's extremely difficult to calculate how a vote of confidence will go in the detail. I think it's quite easy to surmise that it would be narrowly won by the incumbent government because of the various moving parts. And therefore, I can't say to you, X will give the government confidence and Y won't. But I can, I think, reasonably guess that there may be a small number of Conservatives who would not, and there may be a small number of independents, etc., who would give confidence, broadly balancing out so that the government would win. In this um, conversation, tries to look ahead. Um, We've agreed that it's very likely Boris Johnson becomes Prime Minister the week after next. And on the whole, unlikely that there'll be an immediate vote of confidence. Um, bearing in mind, and we'll come to this in a moment, there may well be a vote of confidence in September. What do you think Boris Johnson has to do in late July and August when the Commons isn't sitting and he's got time to act as Prime Minister? Well, I think it's really important that he gets off to a flying start. There is exactly, I believe, 100 days from appointment to um, at the date we're going to leave the European Union and will leave the European Union if Boris is in charge. 
What does he have to do? He has to make an offer to the European Union and say, here we are, that the withdrawal agreement is defunct. Uh, we are going to leave on the 31st of October, come what may. Would you like us to guarantee citizens' rights, which we will do unilaterally, and we don't care what you do in response, we will do that. Uh, we will offer you a massive free trade deal and money if you want both, or if you want nothing, you have nothing, and it's up to you. Should he go hurrying round the chancelleries of Europe as a mendicant? I'm not entirely sure. I, I don't know that, that is the right answer. Um, that I think that could potentially be a sign of weakness rather than of strength. I think it's more important that he establishes his credentials as a leader of the United Kingdom with visits to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland rather than hiring off to see Angela Merkel and going through this ridiculous pretense that we've done again and again that Mrs Merkel will suddenly click her fingers and solve all our problems. Mrs May tried that, David Cameron tried that and it didn't work. So why try that again? I think say what the offer is, get your Brexit secretary or whoever it is to go to Brussels and say, here it is, whilst you concentrate on domestic matters and you concentrate on delivering on some of your other pro promises. So you start recruitment for the police. You know, you begin to do the domestic things that haven't been happening. On EU citizens, um, should he not, could he not make it clear at the beginning he's going to introduce a bill it, you know, almost immediately to regularise the position, which he can do, as you've indicated, without any uh, negotiation with anyone. And can he also not produce a bill that would wrap in anything else in the withdrawal agreement that's not contentious? I mean, the Gibraltar provisions have been um, floated with me, and it was suggested that he could do a citizen's rights bill in the Commons and another bill in the Lords, or vice versa, if you wanted. He can do all that before we even get into this discussion about what he should do about Mrs Merkel and Macron visits abroad, can't he? Well, he, he can certainly make the offer. The bill can't be presented because Parliament won't be sitting. So, they, you know, they, they won't be... He can make it clear he's going to do he that. He can make it clear he's going to do it. He can make it clear he's going to do it. Uh, and there are details to be worked out that if you're making a unilateral offer on citizens' rights, I don't think you have this complex system of the European Court of Justice interfering for a period. You simply say European citizens will have the same rights as British citizens. Much simpler offer. The, the, the complexity goes away. And... Um, Let's just come back to that point about the visits. This is very interesting. Um, I was trying to work out this morning, that's Monday morning as the listeners hear it, how much time Boris Johnson will be out of Downing Street in, in August. And if you ticked off a, a visit to Merkel and a visit to Macron, as you quite correctly say, we made this argument this morning, he should go pretty much straight to Scotland. Well, it would be wonderful if the Queen has started her holiday in Balmoral, if he were to kiss hands in Balmoral. I think that would be a fantastic symbol of our nation's union and that um, it's not all about Westminster. I'm not sure. I know Her Majesty's plans were initially that she would have been in Scotland by... Um, Wednesday of next week, but I'm not sure whether that is still the case. But if the Queen has already gone, I, I think that um, the Prime Minister and the new Prime Minister should go to the Sovereign rather than the other way around. And, and just turning from um, the Queen um, and looking westward, do you think there's a case for Boris Johnson going to Washington in August? Well, will anybody be there? I mean, there's no point in going there to do the tour of the Washington Monument. But um, what you really mean is should he be in touch with President Trump? Uh, that is going to be a really important relationship for the UK and it needs to be um, reset. And therefore, I think a, 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 an early visit to Washington is very important. He's not going to be around in Downing Street much at this rate, is he? If well, he that's, that's, also goes to see that's Macron. Why I, 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 that's why I don't think he can do all this European travel. Uh, I think that's what the Foreign Secretary is for, the Brexit Secretary. And th th these visits to European capitals have historically not solved our problems, whereas the personal relationship with the American president historically has been of crucial importance. And this, the, the, you know, this is Churchill, Roosevelt, it's Thatcher, Reagan, but, but it's also Blair Bush and Blair Clinton. Uh, and it's... Uh, 
The, the American presidency is a much more personal relationship than most other heads of state and government, uh, and therefore it needs more personal effort, which Churchill, of course, understood, and Margaret Thatcher understood, and I have a feeling Boris understands. Blair understood, too, to give him credit. Would you um, also, if you were Prime Minister Boris Johnson, be planning um, an emergency budget in September? Why? Uh, because he's already made it clear he has a whole mass of um, tax and spending plans. And in order to uh, begin to act on them, you might want to have an early budget. How do you get it through Parliament? If you're going to ask how he gets it through Parliament, you might as well ask how he's going to get anything through Parliament, Jacob. Uh, I think getting anything through Parliament before the 31st of October is going to be extraordinarily difficult because um, people will use it as a proxy for... Brexit. So, one of the main reasons, it seems to me, for an emergency budget would be to prepare for leaving without a deal. But all the chunks that you put in to prepare for leaving without a deal would be voted down by those who are determined that we shouldn't leave without a deal. And they would then politicise it and say, well, you haven't got this through, which is a preparation for leaving without a deal, therefore you can't leave without a deal. It wouldn't be logically true, but it would be an argument that would be used. So I, I think anything before the 31st of October of that kind is likely not to succeed. There wouldn't, of course, be votes on spending increases, would there? That can there be done without an emergency budget. budget. That's right. So in, over the summer, therefore, he can, in your view, make uh, some tax and spending announcements that don't require an emergency budget and therefore don't drag his government into this debate about no deal in September? Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I think that um, you're on a better track saying that we should be legislating on citizens' rights rather than on a finance bill, which I think would be hard to get through. I, th I think you might even find it difficult to get the budget resolutions through if it was seen as being a budget to allow us to leave without a deal. In short, um, the Boris Johnson promises or aspirations or whatever you want to call them about tax, uh, such as the change to the 40p rate, they're going to have to wait. Well, they've always got to wait. wait. That um, uh, Income tax is not changed mid-year. I think that would be barely precedented, uh, that income tax rates, because they apply for a tax year, almost always apply from the 6th of April, not from um, the middle of August. So th there's nothing unusual in that. That's completely routine. But um, spending decisions, you think there's more flexibility there on infrastructure or police numbers or um, schools? There's always been more flexibility on spending decisions, inevitably, because um, you can change spending midway through and indeed that happened in 2010. I think in 2010 there was also a change to capital gains tax that came in mid-year. But that is a very difficult thing to do because um, it, it, capital gains tax is easier than income, but capital gains tax being transaction-based rather than uh, um, uh, over the course of the year flow. So you have a specific date for a capital gain, whereas income may be earned but not paid at different points. So it's much harder to change income tax midway through, but spending you can change. So in fact, we can look forward, presumably, to a summer of spending announcements, can we not? Well, there have been some commitments made during the campaign, but you have to be ready to spend the money. You can't just throw money at things. You can't just pile up £5 notes and push them out of the door. So it needs some planning to ensure that the money is correctly spent and goes to the right places. What else do you think he can do over the summer? Or is this really all quite enough, uh, given we only have um, August? He's got to appoint a cabinet, get a team in place, make some announcements, above all, maybe deal with Brexit. Um, you know, Perhaps... Um, go to the United States, maybe go to Germany and France, certainly go to Scotland. Sounds like rather a lot, doesn't it? I think there's a lot to do. He's going to be very, very busy. And what um, recommendation would you make, if any, about structuring Downing Street? I um, wouldn't restructure Downing Street at this point. That's not to say that he mustn't have his own people in. 
and he must grasp the levers of power. But structural reforms, when you've got 100 days to deliver Brexit, are likely to be a distraction. And you need to work out how you want to change the structure. And what um, should he do, in your view? Because um, we hear all sorts of conflicting things as journalists. What should you do with Jeremy Hunt? It's a really interesting question. I, I, I think... Jeremy has been more personal in his attacks on Boris than I would have advised him to have been had he asked my advice, which quite understandably is I was supporting Boris, he didn't. And I, I think that that's been a pity. And I, I think if you look back at the race between David Davis and David Cameron, that was carried out in a much more friendly atmosphere. And I think it does make it harder for Jeremy to serve in the way that he might otherwise have done. You're suggesting it'll be very difficult for him to hold a great office of state under Boris Johnson? Well, I think my view at the beginning of the campaign was that the runner-up would inevitably hold a great office of state, having indicated that he had got a great deal of support from the party and had conducted the campaign well. We shall have to see what the final voting figures are. And that's an important consideration. If, if Jeremy gets 45% of the vote, he will clearly deserve to maintain high office. But if he doesn't, if it's significantly lower than that, then there isn't that support, and that's a different question. And then you do look at how the debate has been conducted, and I think it was unfortunate that he has said some things about Boris that are um, unkindly. It's really pressing this because the, an argument that is put is the cabinet is almost certainly going to lose Philip Hammond, Greg Clark, David Gork, David Liddington, um, people who are fervently opposed to no deal. Therefore, um, if Jeremy Hunt or anyone else is willing to sign up to no deal in extremis, Boris Johnson really needs them as he can't simply appoint a cabinet of Spartans. Of course you can't appoint a cabinet of Spartans. That would be idiotic. Um, but what about Amber Rudd? What about Robert Buckland? You, you know, there are lots of good people in the party who have accepted the need to leave with or without a deal. They want a deal, but they've accepted the reality of the situation. But Jeremy Hunt is a very able man and um, uh, makes a serious contribution to the Conservative Party. Uh, all I'm saying is very limited. I'm saying that in the campaign, he has not placed himself in such a way that he now has a right to expect one of the great offices of state. Why do you think he's done that, by the way? I mean, calling Boris Johnson a coward and so on. It's um, quite, quite strong stuff. Well, there were two ways of looking at it, weren't there, from the outset. One was to say, Boris is very well ahead, and therefore I must do this gently and accept the inevitable. Or this is the only time in my life I will ever be standing for Prime Minister and therefore I must throw everything into it. And understandably, he's made the second choice. It doesn't seem to have moved the dial, but we will know in a week's time whether it has or not. Amber Rudd's now in a position to keep her job or even given uh, the, the need to have a woman at or near the top to be promoted. I've always been a fan of Amber's. I think she's a highly intelligent uh, lady and a very capable politician. And um, uh, just now looking back, rather than thinking ahead, actually maybe it is thinking ahead because this story rolls on and on and on and on. Kim Derrick, what do you think about all that? <laughs> well, look, uh, he sent back telegrams which should have remained confidential. So the leaker is more to blame than the person who suffers from the leak. The telegrams, as far as one can tell, could have been written by any columnist for The Guardian. Didn't particularly need Her Majesty's ambassador to send back comments that were disobliging about the American president. But they should have remained confidential. But they didn't seem to show an insight beyond the normal liberal view of um, uh, Donald Trump. Um, but once they were leaked, and once the American president had responded as he had, the ambassador had to resign. The whole point of an ambassador is to improve relations between the UK and a foreign country. If the ambassador 
by bad luck, it's not, a, not his fault, instead of improving relations, is uh, corroding them. Of course he has to go. And he was right to resign. Were they really worth publishing if they were that trivial, in your view? Well, it's very interesting, isn't it, that lots of things that are secret get much more attention than things that are public. H had these cables been sent back in the open, I don't suppose anyone would have noticed them. They're only interesting because they were secret. I have to say, uh, reading the Mail on Sunday's second stab at it, the idea that um, Donald Trump <laughs> opposed the Iran deal because he disliked Obama didn't exactly come as news to me. <laughs> no. Um, I, I think the disappointing thing about it and the criticism I think that it's fair to make uh, of Sir Kim is that he was just sending back routine observations rather than telling the government something it didn't know and that he was buying into the Democrat view of uh, Donald Trump and is that very useful? I don't think it is. I, I don't think they're very helpful telegrams. Um, and I also think some things were wrong. He said that um, Trump had had no important domestic policy successes. Well, he's had enormous success in uh, his tax cutting program, which has um, hugely boosted the American economy. So they're, they're, they are sort of drippy lefty stuff. Let's just come back to that in a, in a moment. But um, because they were, in your view, um, trivial, um, do they therefore really fall outside the provisions of the Official Secrets Act, which says that material must be, oh, come on. Must be, must be damaging, is the, word, is the word in the act? Who is this lunatic policeman? What does he think he's doing? I mean, really, it's completely absurd. Um, there may be an offence committed by the leaker, the idea that a newspaper publishing this sort of information um, should be prosecuted is absurd and unconstitutional and goes against our history of free speech. And if necessary, I will read out every word of them in the House of Commons so they're protected by parliamentary privilege. Um, but, but hang on a moment. I mean, were I the permanent secretary at the Foreign Office, I would say this is gravely damaging to the Foreign Office. What, to cables, his... cables can be leaked in this way. And I would summon a meeting of all my staff, which he did, uh, and I would want to show solidarity with, um, with Sir Kim, because it must be damaging, the argument would go, that uh, secret cables can be leaked. Well, no, it's, it's the only way it's damaging is that it's um, like the Wizard of Oz, isn't it, that we've seen behind all the bells and whistles and the flashing lights and realised the cables from the Foreign Office aren't very interesting. So it's damaging to their amor prop rather than to anything else. I don't think that is a criminal matter. And I, it, Freedom it's, pretty, it's, pretty, it's pretty clear, by the way, that the... Well, I shouldn't say it has been claimed that the reason that the assistant commissioner said what he'd said was that he'd been called into the cabinet office and told specifically that the press was liable if it published these cables because it was damaging to release that content. But that's appalling. That makes it worse that the police should not be susceptible to political pressure from pandrandrums in Downing Street. And I'm very worried about freedom of the press. I, I think we've really got to fight for it. Um, the, the, the whole Leveson inquiry was anti-freedom of the press. Politicians don't like it that the press are rude about us. And therefore, we are always looking to try and control it. We've seen privacy laws come in without any specific legislation on them via human rights legislation that limit what the press can do. There's this figure who's made all these settlements, who we don't know who he is, accused of quite serious things, and that's all kept under wraps. Sorry, that's a reference to, to, to what? To um, this case that was in the papers about a fortnight ago of some leading businessman. We, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, and we don't know who it is. But what he's accused of is extraordinarily serious. And this is all kept under wraps because he's got a court to say it should be. We've got courts trying to keep things secret. We've got Leveson trying to uh, regulate the press. And we've now got um, the police trying to finger people for publishing information. And you're telling me under pressure from Downing Street. That means we need to be fighting back we've really read, hard. Well, we've, we've read under pressure from da from, from well, Downing Street that it seemed, seemed to be, who knows, it seemed to be reasonably well sourced. Is, is it um, 
satisfactory that uh, the definition of the public interest, insofar as I can see, is that the public interest is whatever the government of the day says the public interest is. Um, which is what the judge said in the Ponting case, and I'm trying to think of his name, um, um, Mc, um There's no reason why you should... No, I do. I was at school with his son. This isn't an Andrew Neil interview where I'm going to um, ask you about Clause 5C. Um, but um, uh, no, that was a judgment that showed the benefits of trial by jury, uh, that the judge told them and directed them that the interest, uh, the national interest was the interest of the government of the day. And the jury roundly rejected that and acquitted Ponting. One view is that the, I'm just saying this is the view the ministers of the day would have taken is that the jury put two fingers up to the law. No, the whole virtue of a jury system is that the jury uh, protects our freedoms. That's why we have a jury system in part. It, it's to ensure that the law is rightly and not onerously applied. Just on a historical note, you will of course be aware that the doctrine that the public interest is what the government says it is was then written into the official I know, secrets I know. Act 1989 because of the uh, the, the Ponting decision. I don't make any difference to a jury. I think they would reject this preposterous notion. Well, that that is a jury defying the law, is it? No, it's not. It's the jury using its powers properly. The ju jury system is there to protect us in part from tyranny. E even when it rules well, against what's go, clearly... Go, go back to the Seven Bishops case. Say, even when it clearly rejects what's set down plainly in statute. The, the jury is a protection from unduly onerous laws, and it always has been. Just um, while we're having this uh, discussion about what juries can and can't do and what constitutionally is or isn't proper, prorogation, oh, where, yes, are you, yes. where are you on that? Let's, let's finish with a brief excursion into prorogation. Prorogation is technically interesting, but is not going to be used to remove Parliament. And any government who did that would be punished by the electorate. Uh, where is it technically interesting? It is or was technically interesting in relation to the cooper letwin bowles bill. That is to say, the parliamentary timetable had been hijacked by measures not allowed for understanding orders to allow emergency legislation that was not passed with unanimous or almost unanimous consent against the previous practice of the Constitution. Yes? And so this bill got through, um, and it would have been reasonable to prorogue for a couple of days to block that abuse of the Constitution. And that was a very limited and interesting constitutional nicety. How do you stop Cooper Lewin Bowles? And there was a way to do it if the government had wanted to. And I think because of the abuse of standing orders and because of the use of emergency legislation without very, very broad consensus support, it would have been legitimate to use an exceptional constitutional measure to stop it. I don't think any sensible person thinks that you could prorogue Parliament for three months between now and the 31st of October. I, I, I think that would be so fundamentally undemocratic. Parliament is there to hold the government to account. And so I just don't see it happening. And so I think the efforts to try and stop it happening are completely fruitless, that, that, that they're shooting at a shadow. No use of prorogation at all. Only in the event of a Cooper Letwin Bowles style bill coming forward again. Um, but there may be other ways to stop that instead of prorogation. I, I really don't think the idea of a lengthy prorogation fits with the grain of the British Constitution. But I do I do note you said lengthy prorogation. Well, there will be a prorogation at some point because this is the longest session of Parliament. A brief prorogation was used by John Major in 1997 and by um, Clement Attlee in 1948. So... Brief prorogation has a completely established practice and is not unreasonable and has to happen anyway because we need a new session of Parliament. The, the question will be whether brief prorogation might, uh, as some people see it, be used as a means of delivering Brexit on October 31st. Well, I don't see why it would. That, that, that is to say, what, what Parliament can't change the law by motion. It can only change the law by legislation. Uh, and is Parliament going to legislate to revoke Article 50? Seems pretty unlikely. But you couldn't use prorogation to stop a vote of no confidence. That would be quite wrong. Uh, 
talking of prorogation, we ought, we ought to finish by having a um, brief discussion for the benefit of the listeners about the prorogation of the Mogcast. I mean, presumably, um, this will be our last before the summer recess, um, I'm assuming. Where are we? We're, um, yes, well, let's see if we can get another one in. It might be quite interesting, um, because if I'm in London the last week of July for a couple of days. Um, uh, let, let's see, because otherwise it's going to be quite a long stint through September, and it might be quite interesting to do one when we've got a new Prime Minister. I'll, I'll see how many of the forecasts we've been making today <laughs> are correct and how many are completely wrong. Uh, that, of course, might be embarrassing to all parties, but we'll certainly try and do another podcast. Uh, if we can, I'm just putting the listeners on notice that there won't be a large number between now and September when Parliament returns. No, but I look forward to returning because um, over Easter, when the fall of um, bank holidays and so on meant we didn't have one for quite a time, a number of people very kindly said to me um, they were sorry that I'd given up on it, and um, I hadn't and uh, have no wish to, as long as you're willing to continue broadcasting it. Indeed, and having clarified that we are Thank you very much. Um, Look forward to the next podcast whenever it is. Whenever it is. Thank you very much. The Mogcast, a fortnightly conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg about the topics of the day.